Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the San Francisco Public Library. Good to see all of you. My name is Tommy Suzuki. I'm with I, she, her pronouns. I work with the Library San Francisco History Center. Let me begin with a land acknowledgement. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples. We benefit from living and working on their traditional land. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples, and we wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community. Thank you. We invite you to our current exhibit, Ralph Chesse, A San Francisco Century, which is on view across the hall in the Jouette Gallery. It is the untold story of a San Francisco Renaissance man and the father of Brother Buzz. So now I'm delighted to welcome you to Secrets of the Cal Academy with San Francisco Chronicles Total SF. Our first guest, Rebecca Kim, is the head librarian at the California Academy of Sciences and has worked more than 15 years as a well-respected librarian, library and archives professional in the Bay Area at institutions including Dolby Laboratories, Google, the Computer History Museum, the GLBT Historical Society, and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. In these roles, she helped capture Google's early history, assisted the production team for the movie Milk, this is the 2008 film directed by Gus Van Sant, and processed physical and digital archival materials from the dawn of the computing age. Then we will have Peter Hartlob, who is the San Francisco Chronicle's culture critic. The Bay Area native, a former Chronicle paperboy, has worked at the Chronicle since 1999. And I believe that means uh, after he was, worked as a paperboy. <laughs> he covers Bay Area culture, writes the Total SF newsletter, and the archive-based Our SF Local History column. The Total SF newsletter and event series were founded in 2018 to engage with locals, explore our community, and find new ways to celebrate San Francisco and the Bay Area. He lives in Alameda with his two boys and wife, Kelly, a superstar because she's a librarian at Alameda High School. Last year, Peter did a podcast with retiring city archivist Susan Goldstein as one of her last official acts. She said it was very fun, leading him into many storage rooms and back of house areas. We're in for a fun night with Rebecca Kim and Peter Hartlob. Please join me in welcoming them both to the stage. Thank you, Tommy. And I, I still deliver the paper um, on a bike, um, get up very early. Um, Tommy, I hope you'll stick around a little bit because you work in one of the most magical places in this city that happens to be six floors above us. Yes. Yeah. What, what, was your, what was your path to get to the History Center? Um, mm. And if you could tell us your path there and your favorite find in the last year? I came to librarianship and archives uh, later in life. I worked first in radio, television, broadcast communications, and a little bit of public relations. And then I started doing some nonprofit administration in the fundraising side. And then I said, oh, I need to get serious about things and so then, <laughs> and have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I did those things at the same time at a somewhat older age, um, not knowing that I actually wanted to work in a library, not knowing that I, really not knowing that I was going to become an archivist, and it just sort of, things fell into place for me. And I actually found, figured out during library school that I really like history. And so I was a little late coming around to that, but 
Well, I've been helped with my stories by you and other other librarians up in the History Center, and it is a magical place. <laughs> Books from the 1400s there are part of our History Center. We have Harvey Milk's papers there. Um, we have a punk rock collection there. What are your favorite, a couple of your favorite kind of esoteric things that uh, we find up at the in the History Center? Well, my favorite collection is um, the Ed Howden papers. He was a civil rights activist. He would, he would not call himself that. I think he called himself a human rights activist. Um, about the era of my father, probably born around 1920, a really lovely gentleman who, so progressive, a uh, white man, he was all about fair housing and equal employment opportunities. And so he worked on that starting in San Francisco. He was hired by Pat, Governor Pat Brown. So he went to work, uh, run the first fair employment housing, fair mm -hmm. employment and housing. It became a combined uh, agency for Brown. And then Governor Reagan was coming into office and he knew he was losing his job. So then he went to work for the Department of Justice, the Federal Department of Justice in working on um, racial matters that would come up across the country. So he was at Wounded Knee and he was at the Watts riots and he was even at the Rodney King riots. Um, I met the man and he donated his papers and he continued to donate them over the next couple of years. He'd pull stuff out of storage and just a really wonderful person who dedicated his life to making things better. Thank you so much. We've got our books up there. Those are from, I think, the 1400s to the 1800s up there. I took that photo when Susan told me. Um, people here who go up there, there's a lot of things that you can find out about your life. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've talked to you and other people up, up there who say that you can find sometimes, you know, a picture of your old house, your neighborhood maps like that. What, what, what types of things are available just for someone who lives in San Francisco and wants to know a little bit more about their community? Right. We do have resources for people studying their homes and neighborhoods and genealogy, you know, their people and various aspects of San Francisco history. It might be like underground water or, you know, various pieces of metal that uh, city employees would put in the street for various reasons. And, and you know, there are just really great buffs, hmm. people who track all of these things, train buffs. Um, we have city records. We are the city and county archives. So we have city records including mayoral and department papers and collections of businesses, organizations, and individuals. And we have some great treasures connected to our two presenters. Peter researched in the San Francisco history for his excellent piece on post-incarceration Japantown. Thank you for your um, dedication to investigative journalism. Yeah, thank you for your help. Um, well, you are here tonight to help us with our San Francisco time machine. I don't know if everybody knew we are going to be riding in a time machine tonight. Here is how it works. Back to the Future rules. If you've seen Back to the Future, um, time travelers can visit just one place at a time, but can do multiple things in that time. San Francisco city limits and no disrupting the space-time continuum. Um, can't prevent the Sutro Baths fire. I, I keep saying can't stop the band Starship from forming. I've done this in like three presentations. I think I need to move on to train. <laughs> the Starship hate has been strong. Um, so when you ask questions, we're gonna go to a q and I want you to think about where you would go in your time machine and part of the Q&A, you can ask your questions, but start if you'd like telling us where you'd like to go in your time machine. And I'd like to start with you, Tommy. Where, where are you taking our San Francisco time machine today? So I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up in the Central Valley. But my grandparents, and actually he would have been my great-grandparent, uh, was in San Francisco working at the turn of the century. So his son was my grandfather. His 
daughter-in-law was my grandmother, Aki Okamoto Suzuki. I would like to meet her when her ship arrives. And that would have been in December of 1921. Pregnant, that was her ship. Yeah. Um, pregnant with my dad, her firstborn here. Um, she was a highly educated and cultured woman who dreamed of becoming a doctor in Japan, became a farmer, farmer's wife. Here we're looking right now, this is 1911 from the Chronicle Archives when the ship came into uh, San Francisco. Came, We kind of figured it out. It said Brannon and First, which doesn't exist anymore because Highway 80 is going through there. But it would have been right about where Pier 38 was. It was not Angel Island at that time. Um, the ships coming in from Japan were coming into right around Pier 38, where right around where Red's Java House is, which Red's was not quite there yet, but that would have been a good first thing to see in this beautiful country of ours. Coffee and a hot dog. Coffee and a hot dog, yeah. <laughs> That's my grandma on the left, my grandpa on the right. Oh, I guess my dad looks a lot like his father, and he dressed like that all of his farming life. The same exact clothes. I think that's a good fit right there. Uh, and then my dad in the water, my grandma with the spunk on the right, and her three daughters. There was a fourth who died. The little one up at the top, her name is Pat Suzuki. She's the only living of this family. And she became a very popular singer in the 19, late 50s, early 60s. She sang for President John F. Kennedy at his inauguration. Oh, wow. Cool. So go look her up, Pat Suzuki. <laughs> you want to listen to How High the Moon. It's the best rendition. <laughs> and then uh, in, the, in the 40s, they were incarcerated by our country. This is... Amachi in Granada, Colorado, where it's uh, in, the, in the plains, high plains, very, let's see, it's the southeastern part of Colorado, and like you go another mile or half a mile and you're in Kansas. Um, I would want to tell grandma, I would want to thank her in advance for all she was going to do for our family and tell her how her nurturing and wisdom would live on through my children and all of the Suzuki descendants. She would be proud of the successive generations and would be pleased to know that our government apologized for the illegal incarceration of American citizens and those like her who weren't allowed to become citizens. And I'd like to tell her we would, we would still have the family farm a century later and even continue to plant the summer vegetable garden. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for getting us started. I do not have photos of all of your family members loaded up here. Um, but I just wanted everybody to, to meet you and know a little bit about the very special community space we have up on the sixth floor. I hope you'll all discover it. It's one of my favorite museums in San Francisco, and it's not even a museum. It's a free place where you can go and discover about your life and your city. So thank you very much. I thought of one odd thing yeah. in our collection <laughs> that I want to offer to you. And the Cal Academy. It's a 100-year-old egg that somebody found in their backyard. <laughs> Peter. Re Rebecca, no, it's yours. <laughs> oh, and it's here. Tell me you have it in your pocket. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We appreciate you. Uh, appreciate you. And um, thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. Um, well, Rebecca, we're going to start off with, uh, I feel a little bit like this is deja vu. I, because yeah, we, kind of, we've done this a few times. We've done this a couple times, but I get a little more excited each time because we <laughs> keep discovering new things. We're going to go kind of chronologically through the California Academy of Sciences. And basically, this is just an excuse. You have a great archive. I have a great archive. Let's show off all of our awesome photos to a wonderful community here. Yeah, so no more talking. We're just going <laughs> to slideshow photos. Yeah. 
Well, you you suggested this one right here. Um, yeah. A little bit about the deep history of the Cal Academy. So the Academy um, op- uh, starts April 11th, 1853. Um, it's just in a law office um, downtown. This picture is from, oh God, 1874. Um, and it's the very first museum exhibit. And so it has, what the iconic thing is the woolly mammoth um, that it has on display. And it's actually like in an old church um, on DuPont, which is now Grant. Um, so yeah, that's the very beginnings of, I mean, looks the Academy looks nothing like that anymore. We don't have a mammoth, um, but yeah, that's our sort of start of the museum side of the Academy. I can't tell, is it alive? No, no. <laughs> well, maybe. I don't know. It's just a still what photo. Is it, I mean, is it, what is, what are we looking at here? I'm sorry. It's is a, it, uh, did they build it or? No, it's a, it's a wool, woolly mammoth that they had uncovered, I think in Russia. And then they had purchased a large taxidermy collection and that's what they, they had the skin and then they made a mount. So some of it is artistry and some of it is real. Yeah. Well, super cool from the beginning, mm-hmm. Cal Academy. Um, this is on Market Street? Yes, this is the Market Street location. Um, and the mammoth is there. It got redone to look, I think, a little bit less like fuzzy, um, <laughs> maybe stuffed animal-y. And then the Market Street building is interesting because the front side, which is what we see here, is all corporate offices. And then the back side is the research and museum side. And so they were smart. They had a commercial, like the commercial properties funded the museum. So, yeah. That's what you see. Yep. Well, we're going to meet one of my favorite heroes of San Francisco who comes in. She becomes very important to Cal Academy's history. And and, uh, uh, we're looking at Alice Eastwood. Yes, Alice Eastwood. Uh, She is a curator of botany, which is the study of plants. Um, And she has a long-lived career. I always have to look at my notes because I can never exactly remember. 1891 to 1950. Um, yeah, so she has a lo- lengthy career at the Academy. That's her career at the Academy. She lived <laughs> to like 112, right? She lived a few more years and she continued <laughs> to come to the Academy and volunteer. Yeah. Um, so it was just her like, I think, paid time at the Academy. Um, but she is, um, she's one of the earliest women curators and she, ha- she only had a high school degree, which isn't uncommon at the time but she was a self-taught botanist. She just loved plants and hiking. And so she had like a little guidebook and would try to identify plants. Um, And she was hired by Catherine Brandigy, who was the very first woman curator at the Academy. And then she comes in 1891 um, and she's kind of um, known for sort of her heroic efforts during like a natural catastrophe. Yeah, not natural. not the first woman hired by the Academy. It no. was a very progressive organization. She was amazing even before the 1906 earthquake, um, lived on Knob Hill, I believe. Yeah. And just walking down the street would see plants growing up between the cobblestones and right like a chat book about it and distribute it. Um, I mean, her life was plants, collecting plants, driving around in old cars that were unreliable and, yeah. and wearing long skirts and climbing up mountains and collecting plants. Yeah, and she also like had her hand in everything. Um, she like helped with the Alcatraz Gardens, I think there was like some, and she's definitely helped with the Golden Gate Park. So yeah, she lived, breathed plants. So we're looking at uh, 1906, you know, after the earthquake. Um, She's in her home in Knob Hill. Earthquake hits. She has been planning for this earthquake. Uh, There is on the sixth floor of the Cal Academy, there is a large, it's like a box, like a specimens box almost, right? Like an armoire, I'm imagining. Yeah, it sounds like cabinets. She had like metal boxes because she was always afraid a fire would destroy the collection. And the herbarium, which is where the plant collections are, was on the very top floor, um, which will which will, you know, show how heroic she was because um, the staircase collapses in the earthquake. Knob Hill, she's in her home, earthquake hits, everybody's leaving Market Street, she heads down. Um, Her house burns, she puts that behind her and all of her possessions and goes to the Cal Academy where the original prepper, Alice Eastwood, (laughs) has put a thousand plus of the greatest specimens in a place where if there's a disaster just like this earthquake or fire she can get them out 
She also packed a lunch. <laughs> she, <laughs> she did. She she's she packed a lunch. I I find that always like that one detail about her. Like she packed a lunch. She knew she was going to be there all day. <laughs> so the fire is coming. It's not here yet, but the earthquake has done its damage, including collapsing the spiral marble stairway. So that only the railings are left? Yeah, I think so. And that's how she kind of gets it. It's really hard to imagine. Because, like, you see these pictures, there's not much left. Yeah, this is what we're looking at here. This is, you know, what was left. Everything's crumbled. This is after the fire here, but a lot of this damage is done. I'm imagining, I mean, like, there's a ra metal railing and she's kind of crab walking up the railing because there are no steps. So. Yeah, but it, yeah, it does sound like, and it's, it's six floors. Yeah. And she's probably wearing a dress. I want to note right now <laughs> that the president of the academy, the male president of the academy, <laughs> grabbed two Guadalupe petrol birds, yeah. two, stuffed them in his trousers and bailed. Yeah. She went up there to get the thousand specimens, but found she couldn't get them down. In the boxes, so she had to send them down by parcels. Somehow tied stuff together and then like kind of um, repel them down onto the ground floor. There were other people there that helped her, but the director at the time, he was out. He was gone. Yeah. <laughs> And the building was destroyed. Um, everything else that she didn't drop down was destroyed by a fire. And Alice Eastwood's thousand plus collection ended up reseeding the new academy in Golden Gate Park. Yeah, and it's still there today. So um, those specimens, yeah, are still. And they're pretty special. They're type specimens. It's kind of how you identify a species. Um, so. And there's our botany curator with one of the specimens that was saved from the earthquake and fire. And they weren't just hers that she collected. It was everyone who had come before her. So, Yeah, the archive at the Cal Academy is amazing. And you just go through and flip through and find these pieces of history that, that seeded this new academy. Um, she lived for another... Uh, into her 90s and was, was like living 90s. by herself. She yes. was continuing... Uh, to contribute and and coming in unpaid who does that after you retire <laughs> <laughs> anyway um alice eastwood um someone that i just like saying her name i wrote a story about her i just want people to know about her um we have three i think i don't know how they're doing on the maya angelou one i think we have three statues that represent um real women in San Francisco and hundreds of men. And <laughs> I'm not saying we need to build statues to recognize people, but I think we need to say their names. And Alice Eastwood is someone I just hope you all remember tonight because she's amazing. Yes. Also crocheted shawls for babies. Uh, <laughs> I know. I, I'm, I'm going to just tell like odd facts about everyone here. <laughs> okay. So it's destroyed. Uh, Cal Academy is destroyed and they decide that a new spot is going to be um, Golden Gate Park. Yeah, to protect, I think there was fear that another fire would co come through the city. So Golden Gate Park was kind of protected. It's also where the World Fair happened. So some of that sort of structure or like sort of um, is in place. So it's where the Mechanic Arts Building was for the World Fair. But a lot of resistance because John McLaren, who is our park's forefather and is the person who, you know, we have a great gift in the city that the city was designed from the beginning so that everybody would be able to walk to a park and have a picnic. And Golden Gate Park, because everybody, even to this day, where we got a little chip on our shoulder about New York, it's a little <laughs> bit bigger than Central Park um, intentionally, but he hated structures. He hated statues. <laughs> They'd put up statues and then he'd order people to plant vines around them. And that still exists in the park. You will stumble into a covered statue all the time. So it was not really easy to get an aquarium there. Certainly the parks department isn't going to fund it. So you need really an angel. You need a unique individual. And um, on the left there is, that's Ignatz and Sigmund Steinhardt. Sigmund, yeah is on the right, and then Ignatz yeah. is on the left, yep. Yeah, and we're kind of jumping ahead because Cal Academy moved into Golden Gate Park, but um, really I feel like Ignatz Steinhardt made it a destination. Yeah, they had one building before the aquarium that opened in 1911, and then the aquarium 
um, as 1923. But it is because of these two brothers um, who made a lot of money during the gold rush. And we've never figured out why they love fishes or why they wanted to acquire. I think we have some theories, but not entirely sure. But we're very devoted, like very dedicated to make sure that the city of San Francisco had a public aquarium of some kind. Um, yeah, I think... Wait, who died first? Uh, Sigmund. Sigmund dies, leaves his money to his brother to give um, that will end up going to the academy to build the aquarium. Um, I think at the time it was, now I'm going to look at my notes again, um, $250,000. But in today's do dollars, that would be $4.5 million. So like, and I, I assume with building construction costs, inflation, it would probably be a lot more. But it's a significant gift for the Academy. It's like one of the biggest gifts they ever have received. Um, yeah, so I know. We, uh, we, we will meet each other and occasionally, you know, we, how are you doing? How are your kids? And then... Why an aquarium? Why an aquarium <laughs> is, is a conversation we often have because I can't find any connection to this guy. I can't find any mention of his love of fish museums or anything I just I, I'm wondering if it was just that San Francisco needed an aquarium or and I think it was like a thing that was happening across bigger cities maybe it's like Central Park or like trying to you know catch up with New York um so there were like a few large public aquariums I, I but I don't know he's never I had never seen anything about a fish that he loved or even <laughs> loved fishing right yeah you know and we're like reading a lot. We're <laughs> digging into archives research, coming to the History Center. Um, but we do have stories and, and, and talks about, I mean, the, the number, the money kept raising. Um, he kept committing more when added costs came. And then when he died, it ended up, he gave, I think, about 40% more. Yeah, it was, a, it was more than they had anticipated, which was good because I think they were like, out of money. Yeah. <laughs> but he died young and never saw the aquarium open. And this is opening day. Um, would that be 1923? Yes. 1923 is when it opens. Um, there's a couple of outdoor pools. They have seals, sea lions, and river otters. There's a bunch of animals. Um, but yeah, he doesn't get, um, he does not get to see the aquarium open, but it is definitely um, a spectacular thing. Also, the city was so excited. Um, um, as a whole, yeah. And it's still like something that people feel so a deep love for, like Peter, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the aquarium that I went to and um, I, I tell Rebecca, and I'm not lying, you know, I, that was my favorite place. When I was a little kid, I loved it. I took kids there as a camp leader in Burlingame at the recreation department. I took dates there, you know. Uh, my wife Kelly's here. Fa a lot of fantastic <laughs> dates at the Cal Academy, uh, the Lazarium, um, and uh, and I remember I you know I took my own kids there uh, certainly to the one on uh, Howard Street, but um, yeah I mean look at that newsboy hat there that guy had a paper out right yeah. there. Um, so a couple more photos here. That's the alligator swamp. I think it's probably. Thing people are going to remember the most gener multi generationally. Yeah, I think so. It's iconic. It's still, we still sort of have a nod to it um, currently with the seahorse railing. Um, it just looks, I've never seen the old academy, so I don't have any memories of that, but like it's so lush and Victorian. Um, also, it's, well, we'll talk more about. Let's just be frank right now. Those <laughs> railings are really scarily low. I've got a photo coming up here with that. Um, for those who, who haven't been to the old academy, it was very much, I, I call it labyrinthine. I mean, you would, I don't ever remember knowing where I was going. <laughs> and I don't, dark. It was fairly dark, right? Dark, not a lot of maps. <laughs> um, I, the most stressful part was when I took kids here and I'd have like, a bus full of 50 kids and like there were always four missing and who know i mean they could be in the hall of gems they could be in yes. the far side exhibit who knows what did I we know. do before cell phones does anybody i don't i don't know um, just forgot those four kids and went on <laughs> yeah i think so well one thing one thing i think is um important to the cal academy from sort of this era in the you know 40s 50s forward was you started to kind of get these celebrity 
roguish, kind of swashbuckling people in charge of that. And we have that now with Scott Sampson is, I mean, when he got hired, I'm like, the dinosaur train guy is <laughs> <Yeah>. in charge. <laughs> um, Bart Shepard, certainly the current uh, head of the, the aquarium, is someone who's probably out on a scuba dive right now. But uh, Mr. Harold here started that, I think. I know. And I think there were less rules. Like, yeah. and, and there are more rules now. So I feel like some of this couldn't happen. So Bart's uh, not like holding an alligator no. by the tail right now? No. Up there. Um, no, I, I'm pretty sure no. <laughs> so Earl Harold, what, what do you think about when you think of Earl Harold, who was kind of the original Steinhardt? Yeah, director. he's like the most, well, he's well known. He's the second, but he was a celebrity in his own right. He's like a ringmaster. He has like a soft spot for marine mammals. So lots of the marine mammals that come to the aquarium come because of Earl, Harold. He also was a host of a, um, a local TV show called Science in Action, which was like you featured a scientist and then you had a live animal encounter at the end. It was like 20 minutes. But the live an animal encounter was always interesting. I'm sure that never went bad. No, there were <laughs> a few animals biting all sorts of people. And I think Earl like got peed on half the time. Yeah. <laughs> he also had a philosophy that right now is kind of the opposite of what I think yes. most zoos and aquariums are saying about um, how they should run their aquarium. Yes, he was famous for saying, I don't want to see any water. So all the tanks had to be like filled to the gill with fishes, like just packed, which is like <laughs> this photo right here. <laughs> Look how happy he is. <laughs> yeah. He's like, more fish. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Earl Harold, uh, I love reading about him and every once in a while I'll stumble into a, a, a article about him when I'm researching something else. He was a character and certainly helped chart the path for our current uh, aquarium. Yes. Um, well, we're going to get to go through some classics here. Yeah. Um, just for those of you who have been to the aquarium, I'm sure there are a few people here and some people do just wonder what it used to be like. Uh, I think we have to start with the alligator pit though, yeah. <laughs> which look at how short that railing is. Yeah. Those children are like five and they can <laughs> fall over. Yes, it's so low. It's not that low anymore. I mean, there's more height. Yeah. You'd have to fall a long ways to get into that pit. So, um, yeah. but yes, very low. And the railings were wide enough. Bart has great stories of um, kids who put their heads between the railings and get stuck. And they always had like an industrial size, like petroleum jelly, so they can kind of like grease them up and pull them out. Yeah. So I think when they designed the swamp, there were a few things. They wanted the height. They did not want it like the alligators to be that close to children. And they wanted the railings to be um, closer together so they don't have to buy so much petroleum jelly. <laughs> How many people here saw this swamp in your childhood? Oh, oh that's How great. many people almost fell in? <laughs> I feel like I've heard this story. Like people right, are like, right. yeah. <laughs> My my like memory, and it's one of those things that I had to talk to like John McCosker or someone because <laughs> I wasn't sure if my own memory was lying to me, was that people would just throw change yes. in there. And that was like encouraged. Like I think it was part of the source of income for <laughs> Yeah, like I think people threw change no matter what. So Earl Harold, I think he had buckets and signs and they would collect it to help fund the aquarium. Um yeah, but yeah, people threw I mean, yeah. Don't do that now. I should have started with that. Yeah. Poor Claude. I know. Like, <laughs> I know. People don't throw change. I mean, sometimes something falls in, but I think it's unintentional. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Battery's running low. <laughs> we need a plug. We're good. We're good? Well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll, we'll wing it. This yeah. is all good. We're just going to... Okay, now no more pictures and just chit-chat. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. We got it. We'll go through faster. That's... I don't know if I'm doing this right. I'm not on a Mac. There we go. Look at that. I'm going to call one of these kids up um, next time that happens. Um, okay, so lots of, um, lots of issues with the alligators. Whenever they had to redo something, there was always a question of what to do with the alligators. Yeah. They put them in a truck once and brought them up to Marin County, and several of the alligators did not survive <laughs> that. So um, very sad. It was a long time ago. Um, also, there were lots of alligators in this. Well, right now, it's just Claude and a um, 
turtle, but like before there were, I think that photo of them, him feeding them, there are like, there can be like six of them. There are like some of the photos. I remember like 16. (laughs) And I know, I know when they brought him in that truck up there, several of them died. And even, even then, I mean, when there was less of a outcry for something like that happening, it was controversial for the alligators and, and for, you know, that it was a bad decision. So they came up with a backup plan and that was to bring the alligators not lying, it was in the Chronicle, it's true, uh, bring the alligators to the, just down the road to Yeah, through the conservatory. Yeah. There was like a pond um, that they like kind of stayed in. I think it's just two weeks, right? Not that yeah. long. Um, but that was, I think, tricky getting them back out. There's like yeah. a whole thing about... Well, they loved it there. They didn't <laughs> yeah. want to leave. Um, so uh, the alligators, none of them died. And then that became, I think, the new thing. I think they went there a couple of times. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But we don't have very good documentation about this move. I've done a little bit of research. Um, yeah. But yeah. I know. Well, I, I, uh, I'm glad they enjoyed it. I, I just think what would that be like for someone who went to the conservatory of flowers that day you know maybe check out the corpse flower and then you see this um okay don't get me started on the two-headed snake Does rebecca maybe you should an- just talk about it because i just keep going and going um the two-headed snake for those of you who did not see it was an incredibly popular exhibit because there were reptile cages kind of around um the swamp and you'd always see like a couple smattering of people and then like 14 people all pressed in around the two headed snake. Yes. I mean, Peter knows a ton more about this snake than I do, but it was found by a teacher in Napa in 1969. Yeah. And then it was brought to the Academy where it lived for 20 years, a long time. Um, And we still have it on, but now it's, it's been um, preserved and it's stained and it's in a jar, but we still have um, the snake. I mean, Peter can tell you about, I mean, I am sort of like, we've chatted about the like dominant and yeah. non-dominant head and they both eat. Yeah, I have a 10 part <laughs> podcast series coming out <laughs> called Deuce Story of a Two-Headed Snake. That was my name for him, Deuce. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a couple of two-headed snake facts here. Just this yeah. is I'm just giving you the bare minimum because there's so much. The smaller head to the left, they would feed that one baby, like kind of frozen mice. And um they would do that once in a while. But the other head ate live mice and they would trade off. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Um and they would trade that off. So they each head ate different things there was more than one two-headed snake yeah but the other one i don't think lived very long it did not um but when it died people were like this is our cash cow so they (laughs) got another two-headed snake um and uh the two-headed snake uh lived a long time there was actually a disease that went through and killed like 90 percent of the snakes and deuce survived (laughs) so deuce was a survivor too anyway um Salute to Deuce. I'm gonna. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers to Deuce. And you can see Deuce is in formaldehyde. Yep. Not quite the same. Like but... we all will be someday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love this. And is this still? There I mean, there's a shake form? house. Yeah. It's not uh, like doesn't look like that anymore. It's but an it's... earthquake simulator. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, most, I mean, my kids love it. Um, They think it's a ride, but. Yeah. Yeah. And you can feel the 1906 earthquake in the Shake House. um, So it's kind of cool. And the Loma Prieta one too, so. Yeah. And when you were at Cal Academy, it was a little bit of like kind of that great America vibe. Like, oh, they have a ride here. It was (laughs) pretty cool. It got more and more intense. Yeah. And they're long, like you realize how much time, like that's pretty scary actually. So yes, we do have, it's a, it's a fan favorite. Yeah. Excellent. And yeah. again, low railings. <laughs> I know. Those kids are going to fall out. Academy insurance <laughs> was different back then. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, again, another one where I'm like, did that happen? It did. Did Cal Academy have a manatee for? Yeah. Almost 20 years, actually. Um, this is Butterball. She, I think it was she, was rescued from a street market in Columbia by one of the board trustees and flew on coach on a flight um and this is earl harold had um, her own seat her yeah i think it's a her i'm fairly yeah. certain Can um, you see that? yeah 
And so, I mean, Earl Harold had tried to get a dugong earlier, like before, um, and um, I think it was a he and um, died. But yeah, so he was he was very much on the hunt for a marine mammal. And yeah, Butterball lived um, lived almost twenty years. Um, died in nineteen eighty four. So yeah, and was like a little baby animal. And like they knew so little about um, manatees at the time. They fed her lettuce, like iceberg lettuce, and a few other things. It was it was an interesting time for sure. Um, I remember we had a discussion during the pandemic on what would you rather have as a pet, an octopus or an otter? Um, 2020, not not a lot of things to do. So these discussions on Twitter took up a lot of time. <laughs> and Bart weighed in very decisively and said, mammals smell so bad, you want the octopus in that situation. <laughs> so I'm just imagining what it's like to be on a flight. Like you're just going to visit grandma <laughs> or like heading to Disneyland and you've got a connecting flight and you're sitting next to a live manatee. Yeah. Um, um, is that Earl Harold? Yeah, that's still Earl Harold. Um, this is like at the beginning. She's getting, I don't know if she looks as big. I mean, she, like the later picture, she's much older. Uh, I think it says messiest eater, and she's definitely kind of a messy eater. Um, Find someone who looks at you like Earl Harold <laughs> looks at uh, Butterball the Manatee or a um, aquarium full of, full of <laughs> thousands of fish. Hall of Gems here, I got to be honest, like it was a labyrinth and you'd walk <laughs> yeah. around and you didn't know where you were going next and you take a left turn and maybe you're at Butterball the Manatee, you take a right turn. I was never excited about the Hall of Gems, but as an adult, I kind of can appreciate it a little bit more. Um, yeah. And we still have like a nod to the, um, it's called, it's now Mineral Hall or Gems and Minerals. Um, and it's on the top floor. I mean, it's a lot of sparkly things, beautiful things. Um yeah, but it's also maybe a, a moment to like be more zen, calm, right? There's like yeah. not nothing's moving, nothing's been alive. <laughs> so there were also freshwater dolphins at yeah. Cal Academy. Um, I remember them. I was there in the 70s and 80s, and I think they were around till 1996. Yeah, the mid 90s. Yeah. Yeah, and there was a little amphitheater. I remember we would make the kids. Um, uh, bologna and American cheese sandwiches. I'd make like a 50 of them and we'd sit in the little amphitheater there and just watch um, the dolphins playing there. Yeah, and they would have, the, they had feedings and I think they had them do like tricks. Um, yeah. Um, and we had a lot of different dolphins. Like, um, I think these are the Pacific white-sided dolphins, but they also had blind river dolphins in the 60s. Earl Harold, like, really tried, I think multiple times brought in blind, um, Pakistani blind river dolphins. So if you think about the um, manatee flying up from Colombia, think about um, dolphins coming from India in the yeah. 60s. Um, yes. So, Rebecca, okay. The one place <laughs> where you can't fall over and die, the <laughs> railing is actually at an appropriate height where the children are safe. All right. I didn't design the aquarium. No, I, I'm not blaming you. I just, you work there, so you're the person I'm... Uh, yeah, I know. Um, okay. And then, I'm sorry, I always thought it was weird. I still think it's weird, but weird in the best San Francisco way that you went to... Cal Academy of Sciences, and there was a whole hall of far side cartoons. <laughs> yeah. And you had with the Chronicle for quite a while a run to the far side, which was just the best. Yeah. And like the first one was just to celebrate the exhibit opening. And I guess Gary Larson would like give out the prizes. He gave out prizes for the very first one. And then people dressed up in costumes and just ran around the park. Um, the illustration on the left is like a sort of custom illustration of the California Academy of Sciences. You can see people and um, animals all pickled together. Yeah. <laughs> he was originally, Gary Larson was a chronicle um, find. And we had a, a editor who um, hired him, the original Dear Abby, and Phil Frank, who was locally famous, and I have found in our archive, because our archive's been around since 1923, Phil Frank's oh. cartoons and like his um, legal, like like 
asking for a raise and them oh. saying no. Like all of that's in our archive. Dear Abby, we have some original oh. stuff there. I cannot find the original Farside cartoons. And if I find them, I can probably just like take them and retire. Yeah. But um, anyway. So if there are no more Total SF events, we know what happened. Yeah. If I, if I just disappear, <laughs> my, my editor Sarah's here. Um, oh, sorry. That's a secret. That's, no, I mean, she knows. <laughs> I've told her. Uh <laughs> So that there is, I don't know if you can see it, but that's people in the run of the far side would run as far side cartoons. And that's a shark holding a little sign that says, what the blank? We followed a ketchup trail for three miles. <laughs> still cracks me up. Okay. Whole entire section for the fish roundabout and the sharks. Um, yeah. The fish roundabout, I, I am a defender of the new academy and we'll talk about the yeah. changes and everything. <laughs> I miss the fish roundabout so much and there are there are reasons it didn't come back and it leaked and there were i mean it had some issues but um fantastic place yeah and so many i've heard so many people talk about the roundabout so fondly um not just peter though yeah. you talk about it every time i do <laughs> it's no two-headed snake um i remember my memory was that was my first experience with meditation you could you know eight-year-old i had undiagnosed adhd but i would get up there and just and forget. And when I was an adult, or not an adult, a teen, and would bring kids here, pretty much 60% chance any kid you've lost is just up in the fish <laughs> roundabout, like tracking how many times the stingray goes by. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also the, got an award? I, I think believe. so. And it was definitely, this is like a new era with John McCosker, who's the next aquarium director after Earl Harold. He, um, and it's a ring tank, so they can kind of continuously swim, um, which is like kind of key when you want to keep a shark in, at the aquarium. So I and I heard it's really dark in there. So it oh, also yeah. was like a great makeout spot. Yeah, it was actually voted by <laughs> the Bay Guardian as the best place in San Francisco to make out. It was very dark. Um, yeah, you you walked up on a little spiral staircase. It was uh, ADA compliant, and then you just went up and were standing on a rug and just watching. It was wonderful, uh, lovely, lovely place. I know people have fond memories, so we always want to include that. That's John McCosker on the right. I remember him, and I've gone to Cal Academy, and I think he—I you know, don't know if he still has a desk there, but a he few does, times ago. Yeah. I've seen him there, and he was um, the director of the Cal Academy, but I remember as a child him, and I didn't know he was in charge of the place, he was at the tide pools just constantly giving instruction to kids. He loved that kind of interaction. Yeah. I think, I mean, he had such fond memories of being a director, and it was like an exciting time. The ring tank had just opened. He's really into sharks. Um, we, they had a shark. Um, and coelacanth, he went to, like, go dive, trying to find a live coelacanth. He also, like, the shark thing was, like, a big deal, like, you know? And he also, like, I've seen this footage of him with um, – Prince Charles, who was prince at the time, going out in the bay looking for a great white together, wow. which is kind of like, yeah, amazing. Very cool. Um, I just included this. I love this mural. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else remembers it, but um, when I was a kid, I loved it. Um, okay, so great white shark. There was a, I mean, it was almost like a, you know, I don't know what you would call it. I mean, everybody was trying to get a great white shark, which yeah. is not easy to do. No. And I feel like SeaWorld was also trying. There was like some competition and there were like these wanted posters. Like John McCosker was really trying to get a great white shark. And he thought like, I, you know, like ideally it would just be in the ring tank. Like it could continuously swim and stay alive. Um, so, yeah. But they do. They get uh, Sandy the great white shark, um, who's named after the person who found her or caught her. Um, and it was someone who had seen those wanted posters or knew that the Cal Academy was looking for this. And it was a race against the clock because you can't just put a great white shark on your deck there, even in water. Yeah. If it's not swimming, it's a ticking clock. So you need to get it quick and get it in and give John McCosker a call and <laughs> yeah. have his phone number ready and that's basically what happened. Yeah, and I think he like trawled for like very slowly so like she could uh Sandy would stay alive and then like John McCosker was like there very quickly. Um yeah, and they it's like a bat signal. I'm imagining you, you just put a shark <laughs> yeah. up with your boat. Um that's Sandy right there and they got Sandy to 
um, I think that's that might be the fish roundabout there. But. Yeah, or some tank, and that's definitely John McCosker. And they're trying, I mean, they're just trying to make sure she's healthy and eating because um, they wanted her to stay alive. Um, yeah, I might, I can't remember what that is. Um, but yeah, the roundabout's really narrow. Like, that's what I, it's shallow. So, um, yeah. But it was exciting. It was like all these news crews. I don't think anyone slept while Sandy was there. It was on the Chronicle. I checked for, for um, three Three uh, three consecutive days it was on the front page. Yeah, Sandy the shark and the King Tut, the Tutankhamun exhibit <laughs> at the Young Museum were huge deals. Like when you were a kid in the playground, you were talking about it. <laughs> yeah. That's how big it was. I mean, and she did swim in the tank, but she kept bumping one part that had a small electrical discharge, which they didn't realize until later. Um, but she was not thriving. She did not eat at all. And so John McCosker makes a decision to release her back into the wild um, and the Farallons. And then, um, but gets a lot of hate for that. Like, because everyone, Jaws, I mean, to set the context, Jaws, the movie is out. So people are really, um, really don't want to, like, feel feel like that was a disservice to people. Um, but it, during this time period, it was a short period of time. It was uh, one of the few times where you could observe a shark 24 seven and see what their behavior was like, because we as people don't really know much about the ocean and like seeing a shark up close like that um, was um, monumental. Yeah. It is one of the, I think it's one of the still to this day, one of the longest times that a great white shark has been in captivity. Yeah. So, um, also the sharksicle, we'll get through that quick, but, um, this was an attempt. I mean, like John tried to keep, get another live, um, great white. We just, it never happened. So in 1980, the next best thing, a, uh, yeah. a, like, uh, <laughs> no, a Swanson's frozen TV dinner yeah. version. Of <laughs> in 1989, they get offered this donate. This other person tried to have like a sideshow with a frozen great white, um, that he had caught. It was much bigger than Sandy. And so they he offers to donate it to the academy um and it's on display in this big freezer um near the front if i remember yeah. correctly yeah and kind of near the reptile room is with the description but had to get a facelift i read i was just rereading something it said the eyes were a little sunken in and so got to pop them back in and <laughs> i've heard and like i'm not going to print this we're we're <laughs> off the record here but i heard there was a mitchell brothers kind of connection and Mitchell brothers owned a um, adult theater on O'Farrell. Uh, and I don't know if the connection was that they had the shark briefly and were displaying it there or they were outbid by the Academy or uh, something. But um, that uh, would be interesting to know because it, it's not something the Academy intended. It sort of just fell like it was something offered and then the Academy went with it. Um, yes. I love that photo. That's our, uh, and apparently some of the people, biologists have said they had to scrape down the free, you know, get like um, frostbite, you know, freezer burn. And so scrape it down, look, make it look clean again. Oh. We had some great emails going around um, with uh, Michelle and Kate from the library and Jeanette and Rebecca and I. And one of them was like, and Sarah, my editor, one of them was like, what's our, what, what are we going to do to sell this? What are we going to do to fill <laughs> this room here? And I don't know who it was. It was you or Jeanette. We're like, Sharksicle. I know. I love the Sharksicle. Put I a Sharksicle <laughs> on it. People will come. <laughs> and people have come. Um, I just think it's such an, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I just love it. And the shark school, it's like catchy, you know? You can make well, a t-shirt. Yeah, we should. <laughs> um, Loma Prieta hits. And a lot of people, you know, New Academy versus Old Academy, it wasn't a choice. Yeah, I mean, it was falling apart. A couple of the... So if you, um, the academy was like multiple buildings and some of them were condemned. Um, and so it wasn't like you had a choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Couple of bonds. It didn't <laughs> hit right away. It took years to get the, the money for, um, initially they were going to do seismic repairs and then decided even that's, it, it's more expensive to yeah, to like, down. yeah. So torn. I mean, and some of the halls were uh, um, like from 1916, so pretty old at that period of time. So down it comes, except for one wall. They kept yeah. one wall up. Um, I think that was the condition of the permit. I get sad when I see photos like this. We have photos of the. Did anybody go to the old Coronet Theater to see Star Wars, or um, we have photos of the demolition of that. 
and I just I tucked him away. I'm like, I don't want to look at that again. I love that theater. Um, so we'll go to the next one. Uh, <laughs> rebuilding, very much a green building, very much. Um, I, I consider it like the old one was like you turn a corner. What's next? Here it's like it's all there for you. I also think it's more. I say it's almost narrative, especially as you're going through the um, Amazon rainforest and then you go down that elevator into the the um, aquarium. It's almost like it's the building now is telling a story because it's wide open. Yeah, it definitely. And it's telling a story with the, you know, it's supposed to replicate the hills of San Francisco. So that's why the domes are there. And it has a living roof, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, yeah, the building itself becomes part, like, you know, the academy before the building was util. Yeah. I can't say it, um, but you know, it just served a purpose. And now this is part of the like exhibit and academy. I think this is the view from the um, observation tower mm -hmm. at the De Young, which by the way, and you should read the Chronicle to get these tips, but I'm going to give you one for free now. Any <laughs> guide where I'm saying like great free things to do, great first dates, there are two things that fit everyone. Musée Mécanique, yeah. You cannot go wrong going to that place for any reason. People in town, first date, last date, great place. <laughs> the other one is the free observation tower at the oh. De Young Museum. You just go up there, it's free. And it's so cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so some things stayed. A lot changed. and um, But some things stayed, and they're kind of subliminal. Um, we got our little low, little stressed out there. Um, and then that was actually carried over. I don't know if everybody knows that. Yeah, I mean, um, they're not the original railings, they're replicas, but they definitely, that was a, a nod to the original aquarium. I mean, they're closer together, right? Because we don't want kids putting their heads through. Um, yes. <laughs> And there's like a little extra, um, but and it's higher up. But yeah. yeah, that's and it's kind of the same footprint as the swamp was held before. Yeah, and and one alligator. There were two. There was uh, Claude and Bonnie. Yeah, uh, Bonnie and Claude. Uh, Bonnie didn't. They didn't get along. Bonnie bit Claude. Uh, I think Claude stepped on her, and then Bonnie bit her. That's Bonnie's story. I yeah, think Claude has a different. I mean, story. he's also. Like, he's an albino, so he can't see well, so, you know. Anyway, she bit his finger off, mm -hmm. friends, and um, and Bonnie Bonnie left. Bonnie left, and then it's just Claude. And yeah. I think he kind of likes it, like, being by himself. Other things that are still there, the penguins came back. That was a big one. You had to bring the penguins yeah, back. Yeah, the penguins, yes. And, um, and they moved to Howard Street and came back, so, yeah, they, ne yeah, they never left. Um, okay, Folk Halt Pendulum was always there. Second all-time great meditative spot. Um, that was always a place where we'd meet because you couldn't have the fish roundabout as the meeting spot. <laughs> but the Folk Halt Pendulum, like it was in kind of a bigger place. And so you could see it and just you'd have all the kids meet at the Folk Halt Pendulum. And then um, I'm giving you a lot of great tips in for wrangling children <laughs> yeah. in 1986. Um, have them meet at the Folk Halt Pendulum. But it's a pendulum that uh, knocks over the little pegs. and Yeah, and it was built in-house at the Academy in like 1950. Uh, and it takes apparently 40 minutes to knock down a peg. I had to look that up. I haven't sat. I haven't been there for 40 minutes to see that, but oh, I'm totally there. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm going to see it. Um, not just, not just the penguins are back. Um, alligator gars, snapping turtles. I've talked to Bart Shepard about this. There's a lot of actual living creatures in the Cal Academy that were in the old one, made it to Howard street or another transfer center and then came back. But the big one is Methuselah who is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Biggest celebrity in San Francisco? At the moment. Not always, though, because she's been, what, it's 1938 is when she comes, right? So Australian lung lungfish came in a Matson liner in 1938. Yes. Um, and and probably, like, around 92 years. They just did, like, um, uh, genetic studies, and they, they're pretty sure it's, like, she's pretty old. I mean, she's old, we know, but, like, pretty close to 92 but the, um, Chron the Chronicle started writing stories. Herb Cain uh, right. started writing stories in the mid '80s about the Cal Academy's got a really old fish in in the mid '80s. This, by the way, this fish is still alive. We're, yeah, we're about to get there. Um, 
and was named Methuselah by John McCosker in 1987. They had another lungfish who they named Herb Cain. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I think that lungfish is still alive, but... Um, but in a separate tank. I think they're in separate tanks. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of drama <laughs> yeah. with... Lungfish? Fish, lungfish and alligators. Yeah. Um, from what I heard, Methuselah had this thing, didn't like having roommates. And I've been there. Um, so started sticking uh, nose up and these lungfish, they can bury themselves in mud. They're like the missing link. They can bury themselves in mud and when the river dries out, they can still survive off oxygen. The river comes back and they regenerate and they're, they're alive. I mean, they're moving around again. Um, but Methuselah started putting her nose up in a manner that made it look like she was dead. And you'd get a lot of people, like little kids at the Cal Academy, like, the fish is dead. And they'd go to the biologists, and I'm sure got sick of that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, this is like a change in time. People actually care about what Methuselah feels, right? Like, she likes belly rubs and fresh figs. Like, I okay, don't... Okay, well, that's one trivia question you just... <laughs> oh, did I give that away? No. That's no. okay. It's okay. It's all good. <laughs> um, but, like, I think that the care, right, has changed over time. I don't think in 1938 anyone knew Methuselah liked belly rubs. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's Methuselah now. Looking good. Yeah, looking pretty good. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, first thing you should do when you go to the Cal Academy, Methuselah health check. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jeanette Peach is here, and, and often my emails start, like, Methuselah health check. How are things going? <laughs> Pretty good. I saw her this morning. <sighs> good. Um, all right. I, I want to talk about what you've got going on right now. And, and I did an article about Monarch, but it was also about Cal Academy and frankly, the Chronicle and kind of how things have changed in the way that we present things. Yeah. Um, so you have a brand new exhibition, which I can't wait to see, but I've heard a lot about called California state of nature. Is this a permanent? Yeah, it's a, per it's our new newest permanent exhibit. Um, it, yeah, California state of nature just opened. Um, I encourage everyone to visit. Um, and if you didn't know, California is, um, the most biodiverse state in the country, um, which means we have a huge variety of plants and animals, wildlife, and the exhibit highlights all these different animals and all their different settings, like forests, coast, deserts, and even cities, like our city here. Um, there's immersive experiences, there are animal specimens, um, monarch being maybe the most notable to this crew. Um, We're looking at monarch right now. Yeah. In monarch the bear, um, it's something that you know, I, I just wrote a big story about it and we were talking about it a lot. And it's really a story and a figure. Monarch's a figure. People believed for many years that Monarch was the inspiration for the California flag. But Monarch was Hearst, um, Chronicles of Hearst paper. The, the, uh, William Randolph Hearst, as a stunt, wanted to capture the last living grizzly bear. Uh, really sad. Had someone go out, report on it. They trapped Monarch, brought Monarch up, and Monarch lived uh, a really horrible life in San Francisco um, uh, in, a, in a cage. It had a mate, had a couple cubs, but at Woodward Gardens, later in Golden Gate Park, just behind bars like this. And a concrete, it would be all concrete, so fairly small enclosure, and was like fairly obese when he died. Um, there's been studies where like California grizzlies probably were about 500 ish pounds. And I think Monarch when he died was like 950. So pretty like he was eating, uh, they were feeding him like biscuits and raw meat. So things that he probably didn't eat in nature. So. Yeah. And I think a lot of the stories about Monarch, I read Chronicle stories and I read, you know, the way that Cal Academy was presenting Monarch was, almost, I feel like, to make people feel better about kind of this horrible thing that happened. Um, the story of the flag was something, you know, Monarch is on our flag, and it almost like, you know, was championing this bear that had some horrible things happen. And over the years, um, a lot of times was presented as, you know, the bear of the flag, or there was a exhibit at one point that was talking about, you know, the history of bears and teddy bears and yeah. teeny babies. <laughs> and that's not how you're handling things now. And I want to like talk a little bit about that, the shift that has happened maybe in the last 15 years and how monarchs being 
talked about today? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so the California grizzlies are a subspecies of grizzlies. They're extinct. They're, um, I think the last known sighting was in 1914. So monarch is probably one of the, one of the last living grizzlies that people would have seen, a California grizzly. Um, but they were vilified during their life. Um, people drove them to extinction, poisoned, and hunted them down specifically because they were a risk to their own livelihood. But it also is in the context of the gold rush and settler colonialism, where people came here trying to like make a living, but also clear the land of local flora and fauna, so animals. And it is, I mean, it's a story that kind of keeps happening. Bears are kind of scary and people don't like them. Um, but I think for Monarch, he's on display. He can also be a symbol of maybe there's a way for people and animals to live together in some some way. Uh, maybe not a California grizzly in Golden Gate Park, but like- but bringing back California grizzlies to California. Um, and and I, I got to interview uh, Peter- oh. um, Algona. Algona. Yes. A, about that and about all of the myths that we've yeah. been fed over the years and the reality of it. And that's um, all something that you can discover in California. And they're mostly vegan. Nature. Their diet, like Peter Algona has done a study where it's, they're mostly eat just vegetables and fruits, which is surprise. I think was a surprise. We thought they were eating livestock or at least fish, but so... And they're smaller than we thought. Monarch is not a representation of California. He's he's way bigger. Um, so, all right. Well, we're about to go to Q and A, but before we do that, I just want to get us back in the time machine. Yes. Vibes right now. Um, back to the future rules. Yeah. Don't stop the band train from forming. Uh, Rebecca, what is your choice <laughs> for? our trip and our time machine we're taking today? I'm doing a safe choice. I mean, I'll be honest, like not all time periods and places would have been a great place for me um, to go to, um, but I'm gonna stay on brand and I'm gonna say the Academy and I'm picking August, I guess, 1985? Actually, oh, I, I switch it to 19. December 1980 if you want Sandy. Yeah, I want, I guess I, my notes are wrong. Yeah, I wanna see Sandy. I mean, so this is the thing. I talk a lot about the Academy history, but I've never been in that space. Um, I've never, well, obviously I haven't seen Sandy, but I like would like to inhabit the space I talk about and see it in real life. So I wanna see Sandy. I picked that time because I wanna see Sandy Andy, I want to, the two at a snake is still on display, like alive and on display. Deuce. Deuce, yeah. Butterball is still around. The dolphins are still there. There's like so much to see at the aquarium. Uh, at the aquarium. And there is a, a planetarium show called the Laserium. Um, yes, there is. Yes, that plays in the <laughs> evenings, music and a laser show. Um, so I and I have also heard fond memories of that. So I was like, I'm gonna do all the greatest hits of that particular time period and also get lost in the academy because I don't know where I'm like because you know, I'm gonna dead end somewhere in the mineral hall. Yeah. Yeah. But I want and I wanna go to the roundabout and I wanna experience what that's like. I feel like that's you know, you can study history, but it's hard to experience the thing itself so great choice laserium yeah. are you going to uh pink floyd dark side of the moon grateful dead or moon rocks I moon think, rock i think i'm gonna go pink floyd okay i don't, I don't think grateful dead but yeah maybe. moon rock was pretty good they adjusted it and had some de la soul in there by the end oh. um i was there a lot <laughs> i took dates there it was not a good place to take a date but i didn't know that <laughs> kind of clueless um excellent well we're going to do our time machine. A couple trivia questions first. We have aquarium books. Um, you can help me combine this. Yeah, and yeah. we have, this is such a bounty, my friends. And we have photos from the San Francisco Chronicle archive, which I will give you a choice. We have sports ones, Willie Mays and McCovey. We have the construction of the city. These are um, all in our Chronicle store. And what I want you to do, though, is raise your hand and don't shout it out. And... Um, and also, um, children, I have pins and stickers after if you want to come up to me, or children at heart, it'd be okay. <laughs> if you really want a pin and a sticker, I'm not going to ask you your age. Wait, are you going to say the prize before or just ask the question? I think or you should. I think you're in charge of prizes. What's the first one? I don't know. Oh. How, about a, how about a book and a framed photo? Yes. Could we and do that? Yeah, I mean, is that too much? It. Because we also have tickets to the Academy. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, so, Did um, they pay to come here? 
Did they? they this was did, free. Did that? They pay me? No. no this is awesome. <laughs> okay. First question. Raise your hand. Which of the following institutions is the oldest? The San Francisco Chronicle, San Francisco Public Library, or California Academy of Sciences? Raise your hand if you think you know which one is the oldest. You have a one in three chance. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, wait for the mic. Yeah, thank you. I should. The library? No, you're incorrect. I'm sorry. No, but like, somebody has a 50% chance. Yeah, now someone who's next. Okay, oh, wait, make sure we get the mic to them. Just uh, you point. I don't know. Somewhere in the, yeah, that's good. That's sorry. Brown coat? Yeah. Yes. Okay, who wants next? <laughs> okay. She said the San Francisco Chronicle, that is incorrect. But thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, anybody want to guess the third one? That gentleman back there? Hold on, we got a mic? Are we using the mic? All right, yeah, I can hear you. California Academy of Sciences is correct. Come on up, you can choose uh, photos here. Okay, good job. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, it was 1853, whoa. Streets weren't even paved yet. The Chronicle was founded in 1865 and the San Francisco Public Library was founded in 1878. How cool is it that the three organizations that organized this night tonight are still here, still producing for you and uh, we're around in the mid 1800s, thank you. We're gonna be around another 150 years. Yeah, uh, fingers crossed. Um. <laughs> okay, ready. What is the most popular piece? Oh, oh, what are we giving away? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, photo and photo, book again? Photo and book or an Alice Eastwood book. There's a book from... Ooh, we'll let them remember. choose, Alice Eastwood book. Choose a historic book or Spectacular Steinhardt. Um, and there's also, I have two photos from the archives. They're just extra prints. Nice. Um, so you can choose, actually, if you want to come up and then I'll help you. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. It's a picture of um, Sharksicle. Yeah, look at that. Um, Put that in your front room. Your friends Monarch, will be impressed. Um, and then Monarch. Monarch the bear on display at the Academy. Nice. Yes. They're okay. not in fancy frames. But. They're, they're, that's heirloom quality. That's yeah. a nice print. They're historic prints, so yeah. Okay. What was the most popular piece of nonfiction checked out of the San Francisco Public Library in 2023? Clue, the book was released in January 2023. Most popular piece of nonfiction. Anybody want to guess? Yeah. That is a great guess, but that is incorrect. Uh, nonfiction. Anybody else want to guess, or am I going to give another clue? Is it Portal by John King? It should be. <laughs> uh, no, it is not Portal by my friend John King, but thank you. Uh, thank you, Mac Allen. You are, you are, biography is the right track. That is good. No, you're getting a little farther away now. Uh, but it, you're, yeah. Right there. On the le left? Yes! Oh. Spare by Prince Harry. Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow was the most checked out title overall. 14,000 checkouts in physical ebook and audiobook, but I didn't think anybody was gonna get that, so I went with the Prince Harry one in nonfiction. I'm sorry if I, I made a mistake there. Um, amazing, 14,000 in, in our library system on one book. Okay, this next one is for a photo and a book. Um, which of the following newsmakers, don't shut it out, raise your hand, has not, which of the following newsmakers has not been documented writing Bay Area public transit? A, Richard Nixon, B, Prince Charles, C, Shohei Otani, or D, Michelle Obama? One of those four people did not ride BART ever. Richard Nixon, Prince Charles, Shohei Otani, Michelle Obama. Yes. Otani did write Bart, and he got on the wrong one and went, we've all done it. <laughs> went to Richmond instead of the Coliseum, and he missed his start. Um, right there, Nixon rode Bart, 1972, he loved it. He said that the Bart headquarters looked just like NASA, and he couldn't believe how quiet it was. 
Right back there, the gentleman in the, yeah. Yeah, you. <laughs> Prince Charles rode Bart. We're down to one. Ah, oh, last one. <laughs> it's her child. Yeah, you. Michelle Obama never has ridden hey. Bart, and she should. Okay, I think we have one more. Print. Oh, this is a nice, this is our best-selling Chronicle print. It's such a lovely print of the Golden Gate Bridge shot by Gary Fong. Um, oh, there's some other, other prints. I guess we'll give tickets away now. Oh, okay, I, I, got a, I got a backup question. The 2021 movie Shang-Chi Legend of the Ten Rings features a martial arts fight on a runaway muni bus on what Muni line did that fight take place? Oh my God, everybody's called. You can't answer. You're a bus driver who drives that line. Right there. What's that? One California. I thought that was the hardest question and you all knew it. I know. Okay, do we have one more prize? Well, we have tickets still. Okay, so. Can we give her the tickets? Yeah, we can give you tickets. If you come up afterwards, um, I'll just get your info and then we'll send you two general admission tickets. So you can see California, state of nature. Two general admission tickets to the Cal Academy. And we have one more giveaway. I think we have some frames, actually. There's frame photos still. OK. Um, the Chronicle recently ran a contest to name the official animal of San Francisco. The Board of Supervisors enshrined the winner, wild parrots, as our official city animal. What animal came in second place? Yeah, that one's a hard one. The sea lions? The sea lions is correct. Hey, you can pick up, you can pick up print. And then. Okay, pick a frame and then also two tickets to the Cal Academy? Yeah, two tickets, yeah. Yeah, just come, uh, just come up afterwards. I think we'll take your info. Yeah. Okay. Um, is Cal Academy okay, or is that like, do you not say that at the California Academy of Sciences? Is like, that too? Okay. Is that too informal? <laughs> to say, oh, to say it's okay. I mean, do you call it the Cal Academy? I had someone oh. write me a letter and tell me not to call it that. She was a docent at Cal Academy. Oh, I call it. Cal Academy or Academy, because California Academy of Sciences is a mouthful and yeah. it's a lot of words. It's a lot of syllables. I'm gonna yeah. send that email to you. <laughs> um, any questions that you have about the California Academy of Sciences, the Chronicle, history, anything that we're talking about. Yeah. And uh, you can start by sharing where you wanna go in your San Francisco time machine. Let's start right back there. Um, well, in the time machine, I wanna go to the last New Year's Eve before prohibition and just wear a flapper outfit and drink a lot. Uh, so my question is, and there's a lot of the, the pictures of the uh, original uh, Golden Gate Park Cal Academy building that show a dolphin uh, statue fountain in front that looks like a Bufano, and I can't figure out what happened to it. It's not a Bufano. Um, I called it a Bufano in print and we ran a correction, so I remember it. I don't know if someone knows, shout it out. Yeah, I don't know what happened actually. That's a Oh, it's in storage, oh, okay. I know that, but do you know who the artist is? No. Okay, it's a Bufano-like artist, it is not Bufano. Oh. It is in storage at City College, and my understanding is that it's coming back, because I've written about it a couple of times, and they have it in storage at City College, it needs restoration, and I understand there's a restoration plan, and a plan to re-put it back in the wild. Yeah. But um, it still exists, and a lot of things, I think, are stored at City College. Underneath, the two places are underneath, there's a little passageway under this library that goes to Brooks Hall, and there's a lot of cool stuff down there, and then City College has a lot of stuff in storage, too. So if you have a favorite thing that's gone in San Francisco, it might not be gone. Yeah. Good question. That's a good, yeah. Yeah. Wait. Oh, sorry. Microphone. I'm sorry. You don't have to run. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> so on the time machine, I'd like to go to the Farland Islands on May 31st, 1944, when the Henry S. Berg, with 1,395 sailors, crashes into South Farland Island on Drunk Uncle Inslets, and everybody is saved. 
Oh, good. Because you can't warn them by you just our watch. time machine rules. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they also drank all the coffee on South Farallon Island before they left several hours later. <laughs> uh, but then my question is, what is the best way to get to the California Academy of Sciences? Oh, no, that's not. That's a Peter question. And why isn't it? Okay. I mean, Sorry. there are so many choices. <laughs> you can take the five Fulton, get off <laughs> at 6th Street, and just cruise through the skating place and check out that scene on the way. That's a great way to go. And Judah, I like going up to Irving there and then maybe getting there's a great bagel place right at 9th and Irving and you can come through the back way, Nancy Pelosi. You could take the free shuttle. There's a free shuttle in Golden Gate Park. Yeah. Um, but a little bit of a trick question because the best way is to take the bike routes that have been restored during the pandemic. And I have nothing against cars if you drove here. All I'm telling you is I'm only gonna bike to the museums. I'm a member of the Botanical Gardens. I've been a member of Cal Academy. I'm gonna bike in and you can take my parking spot because um, I took my 87 year old dad from the ferry building to Cal Academy and I only felt unsafe twice and it was because Uber people were double parking in the bike lanes. Our bike lanes during the pandemic have flourished and I think they're gonna get better. So take your bus if you want, you can take your bike and get to the park and enjoy that great car free street. And if you need to take your car, the garage is still there and there's, and there's spots. there's street parking. You yeah. can still park on the street. Yeah, park Stowe Lake, Stowe Lake. you can um, park all day. I and mean, I'm not anti-car. I take my bike so that you can take my spot. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. 44 stops in front. So okay. there's lo lots of ways to get to the academy. <laughs> Good question. I like a transit question. Other questions? <laughs> yeah, that's not my beat. Any other questions or fond memories or time machine? Or time machine, where you want to go in your time? You don't have to have a question. You can just tell us where you want to go in your time machine. Oh, there's like. Oh, no. uh, if I wanted to go back in time, I would go to the first settlers from Europe who came here to slap them in the face. Oh, <laughs> no. We're not allowed to change the My course question of is, what was your favorite exhibit at the Cal Academy when you were little? Oh, wow. Okay, two-headed snake aside, um, fish roundabout aside, I've got to say, you know, there's certain things when you're a kid and an adult that equally seem magic. And the fluorescent, bio bioluminescent fish, they're not fluorescent, they're bioluminescent okay. fish, they had a group of those in the old Cal Academy that in the old Steinhardt Aquarium that you were going down the darkest hall and you could see it from like 50 feet away and you knew you were coming to them. And I didn't understand the science of it. It was magic. <laughs> and then the great part is it's magic. But then later when I got old enough to look in a book, I remember being in school and going to the library and asking about bioluminescent fish so I could learn and find out the science of it. So magic when I was a kid and still magic when I, when I started digging into it and finding out what they did. So that, that is my memory besides the roundabout and the two headed snake, which I cherish always. <laughs> Thank you. It was a great Thank question. You. What's your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite? You can shout it out. Oh, the, oh, the butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. Butterflies in the rainforest, you can't lose. It's magical. It feels like you're in a Disney movie. Uh, <laughs> well, then you got to go back. Yeah. <laughs> There's more. They, yeah. And it's warm in there because the park is usually cold. So it's nice to go in the rainforest. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Did you? Do right there. I was just going to go the, do the time machine. Um, I'm a big Beatle maniac, so, um, and it's not going to see the, the, the show at Candlestick, but uh, <laughs> uh, I was going to go, I guess, John Lennon, right after the Let It Be movie came out, he was on Polk Street with Yoko Ono and uh, went in there and he cried after, during the movie. So um, he was very emotional at the breakup, so it would be cool to be at the theater when he was there. So that would be... 
my spot. That'd be amazing. Um, first of all, I like any pick after like the 1920s, cause I'm not going anywhere where there's no um, penicillin. <laughs> like I want to go to an era where we've got antibiotics. Number one, number two, the Beatles, like there's a lot of connections. People talk about that Candlestick Park concert, but it was not, the people who staged it really didn't do a very good job. The sound wasn't good. They were, there were no good seats. They were in the middle of Candlestick Park really far away. And it was only a 30 minute show that you couldn't really hear them cause everybody was screaming. But their time they spent in San Francisco was incredible. I heard from um, from uh, the owner of uh, Paper Tree that as a child, she was like, uh, John Lennon was walking around Japantown and just experiencing every there. And she's following him around with her autograph book, but can't bring herself <laughs> to ask him. And then she did ask him and he was delightful. Oh. So I, I love those stories. I, and when I go through the Chronicle and I'm going through the archive, you know, there's the event itself. But Herb Cain did a good job of this, and a lot of our columnists did, of documenting just how people experience the city. Steve McQueen, during the bullet, um, you know, everybody talks about the car chase. Steve McQueen was going to the Fillmore. Like, that whole crew was going there to see Aretha Franklin and Janis Joplin. And uh, anyway, so good pick. Follow those Beatles around the city. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? We got one over here, a couple over here. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed. When I was a kid, the dioramas were my absolute favorite all the time. Always went to them. Do they still exist? Yeah, there were two halls. North American Hall, which was like animals from North America. So they had grizzlies, not California grizzlies, but they had grizzlies and some other birds. I can't remember off the top of my head. And then there were, um, and then there is African Hall, which is kind of still in place um, or brought back. Um, that's of African wildlife. Um, it's sort of, the penguins are where there was a watering hole diorama, if you remember with the giraffes. Um, that's where the penguins occupy that space. Yeah. Totally optional. Where are you going in your time machine? Yeah. Um, I'm going back to my youth and staring at those <laughs> dioramas. <laughs> okay, but back to the future rules. You can go buy Zims and get a Zim burger too. Oh. Maybe go to the Fox oh. Theater. Oh, no. Check out oh. From Here to Eternity. You got a good day ahead of you beyond, I mean, Cal Academy is great. Yeah, right. you're right. We'll work it out. I'm going to go through the archive and I'm going to get you an itinerary. <laughs> I think Perfect. we could take like two more quick ones and yeah. then. Uh, I've been in the museum, but um, I don't know where all these uh, collections of plants and animals are stored. Oh yeah, so the museum, the academy is actually like lots of different things, you know, it has a planetarium, an aquarium, and the museum, which is what the public mostly experiences. But on the back side, there are scientists and research collections, and there are about 48 million specimens. So some of the stuff that um, Alice Eastwood saved is part of that, um, is, par is part of that collection, those collections. There, so it's half the building, it's the back side of the building. Um, I know, I wish I had a photo. It's amazing, it's impressive. It's a time machine. It's a time capsule of life on Earth. Um, so, yeah. And we do sometimes give tours to um, the, like, they happen and they're specialty tours that happen. But, yeah, that's, that's where. And then scientists are studying them and trying to figure out patterns. There's all sorts of stuff happening. But, yeah, that's where they, they live behind the scenes. Yeah. I think we could take one more, but I'll, I'll hang out a little bit. Um. If oh, and have there question. was a great chronicle. I was sorry. We should push your article about the archives and that kind of just um, highlighted some of the items that came that are in the collections. Yeah. Okay. Last question. You, you pick. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, she, I, I, we'll take two more quick ones because she had her hand up earlier. Uh, yeah. First of all, I'd like to meet Alice Eastwood. Oh, yeah. good choice. And I want to thank you. This was really fun and interesting. So thank you so much for this. It was very good. I am not a San Franciscan, but I've been here for decades, and I have very fond memories of bringing my children to the old one. And yeah. um, I now have a grandson in oh. Portland, Oregon. And there, every time he is here, <laughs> we have to go see Claude. Oh. Yeah. Always see Claude. And the last time, um, his uncle was with us, who'd never been there, and he acted like the director, the tour director. <laughs> oh. His uncle 
everywhere because he knew where everything was. <laughs> oh, that's great. Very cute. He didn't get lost somewhere yeah. in the like the old one. <laughs> we'll take take one more. I, she's had her hand. Who is it? Right here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hello. Oh hey. Jesus. Um, I um, in my time machine, I would go to I think the late sixties around Hayton Ashbury Street where my grandpa was living. Um, with, and I would like to meet him. He just passed away recently. So I would love to have a conversation with him in that period of his life when he was like 40 something and living in San Francisco, smoking a whole lot of weed. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And my question is, I actually have two. One, uh, how old is Claude? Oh, I don't know. Jeanette, do you know? I think... Yeah, because he had a big 21st birthday party, um, and so I know he's in his late 20s. 27 27 or 28. 28. Um, And And he drinks Fernet. That is his preferred drink. (laughs) Sorry, go ahead. And uh, roughly how many uh, specimens do you have in your uh, collection? So across all the different... um, uh, sorry, departments. Um, it's 48 million is sort of the rough count, but it's really hard because we have like teeny tiny, tiny things. And then we'll have like a whale vertebrate, you know, or that, which is considered one specimen. So, but about 48 million. Yeah. It's huge. It's amazing. Yeah. You should try to check it out when you can. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank um, Michelle Jeffers and Kate Patterson with the San Francisco Public Library who did an yes. amazing job. Um, I want to thank our friends who handled the audiovisual, and people can watch this at home. Um, the San Francisco Public Library stuff, you saw it tonight. I mean, they were on the spot and, and, and fixing things on the fly. Every time I come here, I just feel like it's going to be a great event, and, and I really appreciate the AV staff here. Um, Definitely the, the, the Cal Academy. Uh, Jeanette Peach is here and um, is just fantastic to work with. Uh, come to the library. This is your community space. And uh, come to the Cal Academy and discover it. It's been around. The Chronicle, I just want to make a pitch. Um, I have the Total SF newsletter. You could actually point your phone at that and subscribe. It is free. You get uh, a lot of stuff that's free, and then maybe I'll point you toward, there's a little more on an article, but really what Total SF is about is exploring this community, celebrating it, the kinds of stories that, you know, we we write about the important things and, and, and what needs to change in the city, but I think we also have to remind ourselves um, why it's worth fighting for and what are the things that we love when people come here? How can we help them fall in love with it? And that's what Total SF is. It's about exploring and discovering the city and introducing you to just really cool people you might not get to meet. So I hope you will check out the newsletter. Um, you can point your camera there, or I can tell you how to subscribe. And um, and thank you for coming. This has been absolutely incredible. You're a great audience. Thank you, yeah.